So let us hear the word of God as we read it together. Great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the maimed, the blind, the mute, and many others. They put them at his feet, and he cured them, so that the whole crowd was amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed whole, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they praised the God of Israel. Then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, Have compassion for the crowd, because they have been with me now for three days and have nothing to eat, and I do not want to send them away hungry but they might faint on the way. The Pharisees and Sadducees came to test Jesus. They asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He answered them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky. But you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. Then he left them and went away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Signs are important, and we realize that sooner or later. When I was a young teenager, I can remember vividly the first time a police officer stopped me, about six months after I got my driver's license, and I remember what he said. He said, sir, I thought, sir, he said, sir, did you see the sign right in front of you? I said, yes, sir. He said, it says stop. It doesn't mean slow down to roll through the intersection. And I said, yes, sir, and he was nice enough to give me a warning. Signs mean something. Uh, The signs on our roadsides have the authority of the government, and you may learn that sooner or later, too. And God has signs as well. Signs in the heavens, signs on the earth, signs through scripture, signs through answered prayer. God is alive. God is alive. That's why we're here today. And God wants to show you the way to him, the way to peace, the way to hope, the way to faith, the way to love. And there are signs all along the way through scripture and in the world around us, if you look for them. Jesus spoke a lot about signs, as he did in this passage in Matthew 15 and 16. In John 20, it says this about signs. It says, Jesus did many miraculous signs other than what are written here, but these signs are written down that you might believe have eternal life. Why are the signs written in the Bible? Not just so we'd be interested, not so that we would be curious, but so that we might believe and that you and I have eternal life. In John chapter 2, it records that Jesus turned the water into wine, and it says this, this is the first of his miraculous signs that Jesus performed in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. The first miracle helped them to put their faith in Jesus. Jesus spoke about the destruction of Jerusalem many times as a sign, and he said, when you see the armies surrounding Jerusalem, then flee for the hills and escape. And so in 70 A.D., less than a generation after Jesus died, when the Roman armies encircled Jerusalem to totally wipe it out, the Christians escaped. The gospel escaped. If they didn't escape, we may not be here in Chapin today. The disciples listened to Jesus talk 
on signs. Often the prophets would forecast a sign in the heavens or sign on the earth to authenticate their message. So uh, Micah and Amos and Isaiah, they actually used an eclipse as a sign that their message was true and people listened to their message because they predicted the eclipse would occur. Moses, when he began the nation of Israel, began it with plagues, signs of God's power. And the Passover, it says the blood on the doorpost would be a sign so the angel of death would pass over. That's where the name Passover comes from. They were signs of the people. Gideon, perhaps, you remember the story of Gideon. Gideon was a member of the smallest clan in the smallest tribe. He felt like he was insignificant, and so he wanted a sign to give him some encouragement. And so Gideon said, you know, put dew on, okay, Lord, Lord I'm going to put this wool fleece out there, put the dew on it, and let the ground be dry. And that guy did that and said, okay, well, the next time, he said, let's let the ground be wet and the dew be, and the wool fleece be dry. And God did that. And Gideon knew that God was really at work. And he acted on those signs and went out and saved his people. And this is the difference, see? Jesus doesn't do signs just to show he can do things. He wants us to believe and act on these things, to trust in him, to find peace in him and hope in him. God does not exist just to entertain us with magic tricks. You know, Herod, when he arrested Jesus, he said, Lord, Show me something that you, some, some miracle. Maybe you remember the, the song of the musical Jesus Christ Superstar. Herod said there, Jesus, walk across my swimming pool. He just wanted Jesus to show some magical sign so he could be wowed. This is not why Jesus did things. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees, two enemies of each other, the Pharisees and Sadducees couldn't get along on anything, but they united to ask Jesus for some authentication, for some sign to show them that he really was who he said he was, that he really was God in the flesh. Show us some sign. Well, Jesus had just done all these miracles. They're they're in your passage. He, He helped the mute who couldn't speak to speak. He helped those who were maimed and and lost their hands or their arms to grow them back again. I mean, that's pretty amazing stuff. He helped the crippled to walk and the deaf to hear. The lepers were cleansed, and they were looking for a sign. Was that not enough? Show us something else. Maybe they wanted this big arrow to come down that pointed on his head or something like that. Well, you know, Jesus just about did that Um, twice. According to the New Testament, this voice came down from heaven that said, This is my son. Listen to him. What more do you want? A a dove which looks just like an arrow descended on his head. And they still wanted a sign. Jesus said, Jesus knew they weren't going to believe him if an arrow pointed on his head. They weren't going to believe him if a voice came down from heaven. They weren't going to believe him if he helped the, the lepers or the lame or the, to be healed. They just weren't going to believe. See, signs, if you don't want to believe them, you don't have to believe them. And a lot of people won't. Today, uh, we have a feeling in our very skeptical and secular world that we don't pay any attention to signs anymore. But that's not true. In fact, I think we, pay, we are looking for more ways to predict the future than any other time in the history of, of humankind. Think about it. You know, we're looking, our, our intelligence officials are looking for signs that nuclear missiles or nuclear missiles that could be tested or might be going off in North Korea. All the time they're looking trying to predict what will happen with that. They're looking to see what the Russian army is doing. Are they gathering on the border of the Ukraine? What are they doing with that? 
People are looking to see how the economy is going to be. Is the economy going to be great or is it not? Should I start uh, hiring people? Should I start firing people? What's going to happen with the economy? People are looking to, to see if their football team is going to win this coming fall. What are the signs that show that my team has it together? I have things pop up on my phone almost every day about Clemson football team, the signs that we're going to have a good team this year. What are the signs that our children are going to have success or our grandchildren are going to be good citizens? What are the signs that they're going to make it? Is there a sign that SC and G might change their mind and rehire people or Duke Power might step in and and help? What are the signs that would predict the future? Every time you watch the weather, you're looking at people who are looking for signs. You know, and they sounds really sophisticated as they look for these signs. Well, there's this low pressure coming up from the west and this moisture coming up from the Gulf Coast. And so all these signs point to a 60% chance of rain. We can predict it. I think yesterday it was supposed to rain, but I didn't see a drop in my house. We're always looking for signs. And we would like to have some proof, too. In our skeptical age, there are lots of people, if I just had some proof that God is real, then I would believe in him. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Because how much proof do you need? Let me give you an example. For example, for two centuries in Western science, they believed that the universe was always in a steady state. It never was created, never was made. It just always was. That's what they believed. That's what I was taught in high school. The steady state theory that the universe had always existed. You know why that came to be? Because if you believe the universe has always existed, you don't have to believe in a creator. Then there was this guy named Hubble who observed that the universe was expanding so fast you couldn't keep track of it, like it was exploding. And it was exploding in this huge balance so that life was not destroyed here on the earth. And... He observed that, then the Hubble telescope confirmed it. And about 20 years ago, they confirmed that sure enough, all of creation, and almost every scientist believes this now, all of creation came from this this point, this moment in time. Creation happened. But you know what? There's still a lot of scientists who said, yeah, 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 it comes back from this one single point, one single point in momentum. But we still don't believe in a creator. Creation happened, but creator... Man, how much proof do you need? How much proof do you need to authenticate that God is real? I'll tell you a biblical story of this. Elijah, great prophet Elijah. Elijah had this contest with the prophets of Baal. Elijah was the only prophet of the Lord left, the only one. And so he had this contest on top of the mountain. It'd be like somebody going down to the Colonial Life Center and renting it and say, okay, we're going to have a contest to see whose God is real, your God or my God. And so uh, the prophets of Baal did all they could to have fire accept their sacrifice, and it didn't happen, and Elijah prayed that God would send fire down, and the Lord sent fire down and consumed his sacrifice, and everybody in the whole place was totally shocked that it happened. And they all bowed down, probably in fear of the lightning and the thunder and everything, saying, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Thousands of people were saying it. They all witnessed it. And Elijah said, okay, you've made your choice. So the first thing Elijah did after that happened, that huge event that proved God was real, is he went to the capital city to talk to the king and the queen, King Ahab and King 
Jezebel. He went to them, and instead of saying, all right, you're right, we're going to quit worshiping Baal, we're going to follow the God with our whole heart, you know, the Lord, he is God, Jezebel wanted to kill him. And Elijah had to run for his life. That's the proof of God. You want more proof? Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Thousands witnessed it in Bethany, in Bethel. They saw it. In fact, they were so excited that they formed this procession from from that town into Jerusalem, just a few miles away. We call it the Palm Sunday procession. Everybody was convinced. Hosanna to the King of David, thousands of people. And then within a week, they not only tried to kill Lazarus, the proof, they cried, tried to kill Jesus, and they did. They killed him. But they didn't kill the sign that Jesus talked about. They were looking for some authentication. Lord, show us some proof. Show us some authentication that you are who you are. And Jesus said, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for some proof. And if they were wicked and adulterous back then, I wonder what they would think about the day. I wonder what Jesus would think about us. But he wasn't just talking about physical adultery. He was talking about spiritual adultery and spiritual wickedness. I mean, their wickedness was like this. Here was Jesus, the Son of God, standing right before them, And they were saying that all these miracles he had done were from Satan. They couldn't recognize good from evil. That's that's wickedness. When you can't discern what's right from what's wrong. And you call good bad and call bad good. And he called them an adulterous generation because they still wanted to believe in God and hold on to God. They just didn't want to believe in Jesus or believe in God wholeheartedly. They wanted God to be the kind of God they wanted him to be. You know, adultery is when you you still want to be married, but you want what you want at the same time. That's adultery. And spiritual adultery is when you want to kind of believe in God just a little bit, just enough to maybe get you into heaven, but you really don't want to follow him or listen to him or let him affect the way you speak the way you act, to your family, to your neighbors. They were a wicked, adulterous generation. They were asking for a sign. We asked for signs, too. Just prove to me, Jesus, you're real. Then I'll follow you. Jesus said there's one sign that's going to be given. It's the sign of Jonah. What was that sign? He was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. Darkness, thought he was going to die, thought he had no hope. And then the fish spits him out and he had life, new life. And so I'll be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. And then there'll be resurrection. That's the sign. That's the authentication. If you want to know proof for Jesus, it's that they tried to kill him but the cross is empty. He's alive. What are the symbols that God has given? What are the signs that God gives us today? Uh, the answer prayers are signs. The, um, the hope God gives us signs. Sometimes somebody speaks the right word to you at the right time and gives you good godly counsel that encourages you to trust in God. Those are signs. There are also some signs that that the church gives us. Uh, Let me talk about three of them. One is the fish. I already talked about that. That was the earliest Christian sign. They didn't, the first sign was not the cross because they were still crucifying Christians on the cross and they were having a hard time seeing that as a sign. But Jesus changed this Roman torture mechanism into a sign of love and sacrifice and hope. And that's what he does to your lives, too. And that's what he does to all of us. 
He takes what we think is ruined, marred by sin, marred by even the death, and he changes it all into life and hope and grace and love. And in the, in the Protestant churches, the crosses, and there are crosses everywhere. There's a cross here, there's a cross in the narthex, there's a cross in the honor tower, there's a cross in the fellowship hall. In the Protestant church, the crosses are all empty. There's no crucifix on there. There's no person hanging on the cross. It's empty because we look at the cross through the lens of the sign of Jonah, the resurrection. And the third sign that Jesus gives us is the sign of communion. He was still in the body when he holds up the bread and says, this is my body. He wasn't saying the bread is his physical body. He's saying this is a sign of me. Do this in remembrance of who I am. This body, this bread is my body, this cup is my blood. They are signs of my love for you, my never-ending love for you. And when you're facing heartache and sadness, you're facing your crosses, your pain. Maybe you got laid off. Maybe you don't know what you're going to do. Maybe you're facing surgery. Maybe you're just in pain. Maybe you're having some adjustment in your life. Maybe you're getting ready to graduate and the future is uncertain for you. Remember the cross and remember communion. Remember the Lord who turns these things into life. Communion, the word communion, is a reminder that we commune not with a dead philosopher or a dead teacher, but we commune with the living Lord who is alive to give us hope, who was raised from the dead to reaffirm his sacrifice on the cross for us, his blood given for us for our sins so that our sins are erased and we can have eternal life. These signs are not just so we can say, oh, yeah, I know about the cross, I know about the fish, I know about uh, communion, I know what it means. They're so that we might believe and have eternal life. They're not just magic shows or something curious is answered. These are from God for you. They are gifts, visible signs, God's invisible love for you.